All right, cool. So good morning, everyone. Welcome back to the class. And uh, today we're gonna open a new session. We're done with cryptography and we're done with the math, which is great. And today we're gonna go to another session which is called authentication. And before I start to talk about authentication, first of all, uh, first of all I wanna talk about logistics. So, um, because for this session, uh, today is also the last live session. Starting from next week, we are going to have a recorded session in this time. And we're gonna just like switch to the other session to start to teach lightly. And there will not be a class on Thursday. So please do remember, no class on Thursday. Um, if we're friends, uh, doesn't like your friend didn't come for today's course, please also just pass this message to our friends. Um, also, I will announce that in Piazza so that everyone will know about it. So yeah, there's no class on Thursday again. And um, uh, so the next lecture for this session is gonna be on, on Tuesday and it's gonna be a recorded session. And it's, it's still gonna be me, but like I'm gonna just replay what have recorded on Monday and then um, to discuss or to communicate with you via typing. Um, question is this holiday? It's not a holiday. It's just like I have some business that I have to attend during that day. So I cannot really teach. Um, so yes, you're allowed to attend Monday once the session, if you want to, you know, attend a uh, live session, you are, you have the right to jump over these two sessions. It's gonna be like, we don't have any restrictions, it's gonna up to you to decide which session you wanna go. If you have time, feel free. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it's the same stuff. The content is exactly the same, but sometimes just like people prefer to have more um, like speaking-ish communication with me, uh, like our communication. So someone will perform a live session uh, and someone just like think that watching video is better than having me just speak on live. So someone would prefer record a session. So it's good. It's really just like up to you. And uh, I will leave you to decide which one you wanna attend. All right. Oh, and this, also, another thing that I would like to announce is that we will have assignment released this week. So just be prepared for that. Um, um, it's gonna be about crypto. So if there is anything that you're not clear about crypto, I think now is a good chance for you to just review this content so that you will be more ready to start your assignment. All right. Now let's start today's content. Uh, oh, actually, before I start, sorry. I, I, I saw some questions from chat. Will the crypto slides be released? Yes, the crypto slides is already released. If you check the course website, it's already there. And also the videos already online in YouTube. You can click the link and then visit the previous videos. All right, now let's start today's content authentication. So um, first thing that I wanna do is a poll or say a question to you. Please just type in a chat whether or not you still remember authorization. Like, have you heard about authorization before? Have you heard about authorization in this class? That's nice. Many of you said yes. And in fact, if you say no, I would tell you that go to the access control slides, go to the access control session taught by Adam, because Adam has mentioned this before. It's okay that you forget about it, that's totally fine. I mean, I also forget about things, but just like, this is probably something that you would need to know. So if you can't remember, just go there, you will be able to get it. Okay, so, then can someone just tell me what's the difference between authentication and authorization? I know that you may not know about authentication, but 
can you just like based on the the word itself, you guess what it mean? What's the difference? Or just like give and give me an explanation of what authorization is. Or give me some example, like an example that can differentiate this two. Thomas gives a very nice explanation. He said, authentication is like, you are who you say, you are who you say you are. And authorization is what you are allowed to have access. That's a very nice explanation. Joseph says that authorization is the policy. Yes, that's like the access control policy that you have implemented in your previous assignment. And Michael says that verifying a user's identity versus allowing a user privilege, that's also correct. Eric says that um, authentication is the user who say who they say they are, yes. And authorization is the user able to access something. That's correct. Guys, You what you have say are all correct. This is great. I'm very impressed. So let me just recap what you have just said. Authentication is about a user or maybe you are claiming who you are. And authorization is someone authorize you, someone claim that what you can do. It's like the access control, like the turn key, who can turn the key in the assignment. And also if you still like go back to the assignment, if you remember the content for assignment two, authentication is something that the assignment doesn't cover, but it's something like if it is Adam turns key, and in the assignment, you just wrote Adam, Adam turns key. But maybe that guy is not really Adam. How do you know that it is really Adam that turns the key? It's not Tiffany impersonating Adam that turns the key, right? And that is about authentication. All right. And we're going to talk about authentication throughout today's core, today's lecture and also probably next lecture as well. So uh, similar to crypto, let's just start with some terms so that you will have a, um, you know, a clear notation when I speak those terms later, when I start to explain more things and using those terms. So the first thing is called principle. What's a principle is? Uh, anyone have heard about principle before? I mean, I guess maybe you use this word before, but probably not in the security context, right? So principle is a unique identity. So you can consider principle as like me, myself, or you, like yourself, like you as the person, you are identity, you are principle. And then identity. Identity is like your handle. So identity, is something that is stored like in a system, in a computer that identifies or that represents this specific principle. For example, I have a handle and uh, my, um, my, my handle is like Tiffany B. If you look at my Discord, Tiffany B with some members, that's me, myself. Or if you look at the uh, Piazza, uh, my handle is just like my name. So it's Tiffany Bao. So that is identity. So identity specifies a principle and identity is something that is stored in a computer, in a system. It is, it is also like internal representation. As I just said, like it is internal in the sense that it is internal, it is in the system, it is in a computer. Okay, and the third is subject. Subject can be anyone. So subject is someone who acts on behalf of an entity. So I am true Tiffany Bell, but um, Adam may want to impersonate me or say Adam is the true Adam and me, Tiffany wants to impersonate him. So I may act on his behalf in a malicious or in a benign way. 
for example, maybe I want to, um, I'm trying to get an example. For example, um, I want to go to my bank. I want to withdraw some money, but maybe I don't have time. So I delegate this to someone else, to a, a close friend of mine to withdraw some money for me, go to the bank and I use my bank account to get some money for me. And if this is the case, then the subject becomes my friend, not just me. So subject can be anyone, a, not only just a principal, but it is just like anyone that acts on behalf of a principal. And then what is authentication? Authentication is to bind an identity to a subject. And here I want you to really just be careful that what I'm talking here is it binds it and sorry, it binds an identity to a subject. It's not really binds identity to a principle. So authentication can bind identity to someone who's trying to act on behalf of an entity, a principle. And that subject may or may not be the actual principle. But authentication doesn't know really the true person, who the true person is. Authentication only cares about the identity, which is something that stores in the system, and the subject who is operating and interacting with the system and acting on behalf of the principal. So I want you to really like be able to differentiate this because um, this, is, this is the reason why like authentication, even though a system can guarantee authentication, it doesn't mean that the system is secure because he will be able to use his authentication rules or principle, uh, uh, like the functions, which we, you will talk, I will talk about that later. Like he will use his ways, his selection functions to decide whether or not this person is the identity, but that person may not be the true person. And sometimes it is okay because the person will just delegate this, but this subject to represent for him or her, but sometimes this is not okay. So that's why when you talk about authentication, even though authentication like is secure, it doesn't mean that the entire system it is secure. All right, so now I wanna pause here a little bit and making sure that I explain this clear to me, to you. All right, then let's continue. Now we have an example. Um, so as I just said, principal is a true person. So the example is I, Tiffany Bao, is a principal. And then I have a handle, I have an account um, in systems such as GitHub. So Tiffany B is my handle and that is my identity in GitHub. And then someone else can ask me half of me. So someone can just uh, lock in uh, pretending that he or she is Tiffany. And it can be just me, right? It, or it can be someone else. So this is called a subject. So subject is trying to act on behalf of Tiffany, such as to log into the system. And then authentication is trying to map between this subject who's operating and really had like the true handle, which is Tiffany B. So that is the, the, like the operation where that is what authentication tries to do, to map subject with identity. So there's nothing really related to the principle. All right. Okay. So regarding authentication mechanisms, then how would authentication do? What Usually like, oh, let me clear this, sorry. So I want you to give me some of the examples to talk about what kind of authentication have you seen in the practice? So usually how can you authenticate that the subject is the true identity? Two-factor authentication. Yes, you're right, Steven. 
two-factor authentication. And Faisal and Armin also talk, also mentioned that. So ASU has two factors, right? I believe that you saw the uh, you install the uh, the two-factor authentication. I'm not sure if this is a like a requirement at ASU, but like you must have that. I'm not sure if if that is true. They just right. started uh, enforcing it for students. I just got an email that said we have to start uh, doing it, but employees have had to do it for a while. Yeah, uh, that's good to know. Uh, so, right. I mean, I myself as an employee, I think I started to use the dual thing for ASU since one year or probably two years ago. But it's nice that now students also are forced to do it. So, yeah, that is authentication. And anything else? Rogelio said password. And yes, that's also authentication mechanisms. And anything else? CAPTCHAs? Um, that's a very interesting example because the um, CAPTCHAs, the, or say the purpose of CAPTCHAs is to test whether or not you're a robot or a, a person, like a true person, right? So it doesn't really authenticate who you are. But um, it tries to differentiate, like, uh, as I said, like if you're a robot or a or human, I wouldn't say captures is authentication, or I would, I would probably just hesitate. Um, that is a very good example, though. Um, hmm. Yeah, I mean, I'm not sure, but we will talk about CAPTCHA in future lectures, next lectures to be more specific. All right. Maybe and then our Jason, ID cards. Sorry, what'd you say? Right sorry, here? maybe our ID cards. Like every time we enter a building, we need a swipe. Mm -hmm. ID card, yes, that's also true. Like ID card is something that you swipe and then they read it, right? So there is definitely information over there and they authenticate you like, or who, someone who swiped the card by reading the content in the card. That is also a good example. So um, one thing like two factor uh, 2FA is something that is related to what you know, right? Like what you know about this the second password who, uh, which was sent to your mobile phone. Um, but also this is also related to what you process. Like it thinks that it thinks that if you have this phone and your phone installed the two factor, app correctly, then it's likely that you are who you are. Like you are the true person that the authentication mechanism ought to pass. And Jason mentions about physical security keys. And that's correct. And this is exactly about what your process. Cool. Uh, and I'm going through you guys chat and by the way, this is nice. You guys gave a lot of very interesting examples. Let me just spend some time to go through it. Um, Dean mentioned about fingerprint and facial ID. That's true. Fingerprint is what you process. Like you have the fingerprint on your finger, right? And facial ID, that's also true. Like it is what you like, you have the nose in this way. You have this, your face layout. Your, your organ layout on your face, and this is what you process as well. Although that sounds a little bit weird. <laughs> yeah, biometrics is really great. Um, so another thing about what you know um, is like, sometimes they will ask you security questions. For example, they will ask you to set up something like, uh, what's the maiden name of your mother? What is the city that you are born? Something like that, right? So this is about what you know. Well, yes, exactly. What's her first pass name? Thanks, Rogelio. Right. So those are also something about what you know. And then the third is about what you are. So it's like what you're doing. Are you a student or are you a uh, employee? And then the last is where you are. I don't know if you guys have have uh, come across this, but it's like sometimes if I when I travel and then if I just like. Uh, I'm trying to give it give it this an example. Or okay, so if I'm travel and if I just like re-log into my inbox, Gmail, and sometimes my I'm using a Pixel phone, so sometimes my Pixel 
where it just pops up a message saying that, oh, now we saw a login activity in this specific place like Atlanta or Florida, some places like that. And please just click the confirm button if you are really just like around that area and access like authenticate that specific login, right? So it is a way to check where you are and wanna make sure that the guy who is there is the right person. And also another example is like your credit card. Sometimes if you travel long the way around and then use a credit card, you will realize that your payment got blocked because they think that maybe your credit card was stolen. So that's why you have, you usually pay something in Tempe or in Phoenix, but now you become someone in California and they're paying something. So also your location is uh, one of the mechanisms that authentication can use to prove that you are really you. Okay, so there are all different kinds of authentication mechanisms and, and now let's just make it a little bit more formal. And also, um, guys, I know that we have been talking about many formal things, like we talk about crypto system, we talk about authentication system, and you may ask, like, why do I care about this, right? And then you may ask that, or you may ask, do I have to memorize this? So the answer is no, you don't need to memorize this. And um, I don't think any of the exam in our class will be something like, oh, recite and uh, write down the representation of authentication system or the representation of a crypto system. But the reason why we want to introduce this to you is that we hope that you have a systematic um, understanding of usually how an authentication system looks like. Or say in the future, if you have some real world example, if you look at some true authentication, you will know that those are some elements that you need to think about if you want to describe some authentication system in practice. So that is the reason why we want to have a system. We want to systemize those elements that needs to exist uh, in terms like for authentication or for a crypto. Okay, so then let's talk about authentication system. Authentication um, is composed of five elements. Uh, ACFLS. No worries if you don't know what they are, because even though, even if for me, if I look at these five letters, I have no idea what it is, which is fine. So A is authentication information that proves identity. For example, it's a password. So I do want you to pay attention that here, this is the information that proves identity. So it is not identity in itself. It is something that can prove the, um, the identity. So like identity, it can be account name. But then A is the information that uh, means that if someone can, pro can provide this information, then this guy can be considered as like past for, for giving to prove that this guy is the, this, the true identity. So for example, password is an authentication information. Okay, and then the next is C, it is complementary information stored on a computer and used to validate authentication information. And can someone give me some example? Like what kind of complementary information stored on a computer can be used to validate authentication information, like can use to validate A, the authentication information that proves identity. Yes, okay. So um, I saw those examples you guys were giving like cookie, that's true. It is an information, it's complementary and it's stored and to use to validate authentication information. Cool. Security questions, yes. Also, IP address, why is that? Can you just be more specific, Armin? 
and also for markers, I'm not quite sure what you mean by special link. Yeah. Yeah, okay. like an IP address would like log your location. Oh yes. Or your specific IP, so you can use that as like you frequently log into Facebook or Google or something, and it's seeing that you're logging in from that specific address. But if you log in from another address, it'll okay. like freak out. And... Right. Exactly. That's a good example. So IP address can also be complementary information. Location, I think you're right. Like when you talk about location, it can be physical location or your computer location. So it's like your physical location or IP address. Cool, mobile pass, that's also correct. Security questions, right? Great, you guys give many interesting and many correct examples. Public key, MAC address that can be also used for like to, to validate authentication information. And those are all different kinds of complementary information. Great. And then a third is a complementary functions. And what it means is that like for computer, suppose that now you're, uh, you're programming a system, right? So you know that someone's gonna store their identity to you. And then now you know that there are some complementary information uh, stored um, you know, in your system, like the system, we're gonna ask those complementary information to someone who's registering to your system. And then um, it's gonna be used to validate authentication information. But you have to know the mapping between someone uh, with the specific identity or say like, for example, Tiffany B, right? So you wanna know what is the exact complementary information that Tiffany provides when she registers. So you need a function, you need a mapping between a specific entity to specific complementary information because everyone's complementary information, although maybe it's the same type, like maybe it's all IP addresses or maybe it's all MAC addresses, but everyone's exact IP address or MAC address is different. So you want to have a mapping and this is the so-called complementation, complementation functions. So it is a function that maps a specific identity to complementary information. And then the next is authentication functions that verifies identity. So this is something that we just talked about, like those different kinds of mechanisms. But the goal for it is to verify whether or not this guy or like a subject who tries to operate on behalf of um, a principal, whether or not this subject is really the true identity, right? So it is, it's like a judgment. So it is a function that takes into the authentication information and perhaps the, comp the complementary information as well. You can give like empty complementary information depending on how your system like is designed. It's like if you are um, using a system that only asks you for password, then A is the password and then a C here is like, is an empty thing. So it's like there's no C, which is also fine for authentication functions. But the key is that for no matter information that this authentication functions take as input, it will only just output whether or not it verifies identity correctly. So it's gonna output a boolean, true or false. And then the last is as it is selection functions, which enables identity to create or alter information in A, in a or C. So you want to open this interface uh, for someone to change their password or change the security questions um, they may change the IP address if there is like a specific restriction for the IP address or the MAC address. So you want to have this interface for, for the identity to like register themselves, create or change information in A or C. So this is the entire authentication system. And now looking at this, can someone just give me an example? Like, what kind of system that you've seen in your daily life is can be considered as an authentication system? Bank account. 
That's correct. And when you log into my ASU, that's also correct. Pearson, what is Pearson, Caleb? Actually, I don't know what that is for ASU. Maybe this is something that you need to teach me. My ASU login for sure, log into the computer, yes, for sure. Google login, right. Ah, oh, Pearson's a textbook website, that's good to know. Then for sure, so it's like for the textbook websites, then you need to, um, you need to uh, authenticate yourself because it's not everyone will have access to the textbook website. It's not a public website. And log cell phone, right? That's correct. And very interesting, like for as a log cell phone, you're not really typing the password. Sometimes you use patterns. So pattern can also be an authentication information. Lock into video game, right. SSH, yes, that's also true. Basically, almost everything that you can think your mind about something that you log in or you have account, you create an account and then you try to log in, those are something that is related to authentication. Because after all, the reason why you need to log in is to tell the system that someone that is trying to log in right now is the true person for that specific account. Typing the PIN when I use my credit card, right? Because in this case, then, you know, the PIN is the authentication and the credit card, like the number of the credit card, that is the call and call identity in the system. Okay, that's nice. And now I'm gonna give you an example. Um, password system, okay? So password system and um, for example, um, hmm, let me try to think about this. Okay, so password system, uh, I think right now I'm gonna just open my virtual machine and show you around my virtual machine, which is a Linux machine. And I'll show you around the password system in Linux. Just give me a second. All right, let me share, start a new share with you. Okay, can you guys see my screen? Let me zoom it. Okay, I suppose you can see it, right? Cool. So this is my Linux machine and I'm using Ubuntu. And for Linux operating system, it has a password system. Um, let's take a look at this specific file. So usually, uh, for example, here, if I type who am I, you see that this is Tiffany B, right? So this is my identity. And of course, I want to tell you what my password is, but you can just check all the users in the system. So you can try to look at by the way, if you have a Linux machine right now, you are also very welcome to, you know, just follow what I am typing right now and then check the password system in your machine, like in your Linux machine. So we can do this all together. But if you don't have one, that's also fine. You can just like look at my screen. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna check, take a look at this file. This is the file that Usually like for a Linux system to store some information about users and the related password. All right, so I just do a cat and you found that this is me. There are many different kind of like um, users. And now let's just like take a look at of me, myself. All right, here we go. 
So this is me, this is my name, right? I mean, my handle, my identity, Tiffany B, right? And then this X, it means that I do have a password, but this file is something that is public to everyone. So I don't want to really let you read the password. Like basically anyone who has the right to access the system will be able to read this file. And in fact, let me just do a um, LS so that you will know the permission of this, like this file. So you see that everyone can read the R, um, I mean, the R pattern is enabled. So everyone can read. That's the reason why I don't really want to show my password here. So here it says it is X. And in fact, if you look at another file, it's called shadow, yeah. Oh, good. All right, so this is the part that really stores something related to my password. Which I will talk about that later. Okay, and now let's just go back to the uh, password one. So this second notation, it says that I have a password, but it's not going to display right here. And the third is my user ID. So usually for Linux system, they just remember every user by a number. So they don't use um, really like this. Uh, Tiffany B as my handle, when it stores in the system, it uses a number. So you use a number to represent me. And in fact, if you have ID here, you will see that this is my ID. It's like for ASU, you have ASU ID, but you don't you really use it. As that you use it, your ASU right, like your like T bow or something like that, right? So that is different. And then this is a group ID, like I belong to a group. For example, for me, I belong to SIGSI at ASU. And in the operating system, I also belong to a specific group. And this group also called Tiffany B in this specific case, although it can be something else. All right, so the second is my group ID. Uh, not the second, sorry, this is the fourth is my group ID. And then the fifth information is the complementary information that we just talked about. So. For me, my complementary information is my full name, which is Tiffany Bell. So I put it over here. And then the rest of it is not really about authentication. It's just like, it records, this is my home directory. And this is the bash command that if I want to open a terminal, it's gonna just go to the bin bash, not to the other like, uh, like ZSH, the other kind of like terminals. All right, so, this itself is how Linux, or to be more general, how Unix use uh, to remember people's password. And now let's just go back to the password system. Go back to the slides and later on we'll come to here again. Let me go back to the slides, just one second. Okay, so password system. Password usually is not stored in plain text, right? So first of all, this is more of a question, like should password stored in plain text or not? And the answer is no, you don't want to display it in plain text. And if you, um, you may already heard about some, you know, some infamous or nauseous news that like some of the game companies or some of the uh, other systems, they got a data, lead, a data breach. So the user account, as well as the uh, password got leaked. And because the password is stored in plain text, then someone who just dumped database will be able to know all the password for all the users, which is really, really bad. So you don't want this to happen. And then for the authentication system, again, let's just go through those elements, essential elements, one by one, and then talk about what are they in a password system. Okay, so A is password, right? It's a set of string that can be used for password. And then C here, I mean, for password, you can set this as A or you can set this with something else. And actually when we talk about Linux 
improve your password system, which is something that I will show you later, like go back to the, the Linux virtual machine, you will see that the C is actually not exactly the A. But usually for password system, you can consider this is the same. It can be different or it can be the same. And then F is the set of complementary function. And then L is, is an equality test operation. Basically, you're asked to type your password, right? So, and then just like decide whether or not your password is correct. So this is a normal password system that can, can have like, ask you to type the password. And then if you pass that password, then you will think that, okay, you are the right identity. And Dean was asking, C is the hash of A. That's correct. That's correct for Linux operating system. So I will show you guys later on. You will see that. And actually to be more specific, C is a hash of A plus something, which is called salt. So I will talk about that later. And um, so Tate was asking, which encryption protocol does Linux use? That's a good question. I will also mention about that later. Uh, and then S is the function to, you know, you can set the password or you can change the password. Like in Linux, you can do that, right? So this is, I would say this is like a typical password system. And then now let's be more specific. Just talk about the Linux or say the Unix encrypted password system. And this is something that I just show you. And let's just keep exploring first is password. So password is a string of eight characters or less. I think this is just the initial setup for Unix encrypted password system. And now you can extend it, they already changed it. So you can have um, more characters and actually you're encouraged to have more characters. And then C, which is the, like the complementary information that can also be used to, to prove your identity. This is something that Dean just said. So it is a hash of your password, but to be more specific, it contains not only just a hash, but also a random, like, you know, like a random, which is called salt, like a random things, this part, a two character hash, hash ID and appended by a 11 character long hash. And let's, let me just show you, you know, my operating system. And we can take a look at this in the actual Linux system. And this comes to the shallow one. Like here again, if you look at this, it doesn't show the password. And, be, and this is because everyone can read this specific file. So you don't want other people to know the exact password is. But then how Linux managed to store your password if it is not in plain text and how Linux managed to uh, authenticate you if you try to log in. So the way that Linux works is that it used hash function. And now we already talked about hash function in crypto. So you know, like on the um, low level, like on the implementation level, what is a hash function and what kind of nice property that a hash function should have. And one is that hash function is something that is like, it's kind of one way. So you can calculate a hash given a string very quickly but given a hashed string, it's gonna be very hard for you to reverse back. So the way that Linux works is that, if you look at, look at the, another file, the shadow file. Oh, sorry. So this is the file that stores my password, but instead of storing the plain text of my password, it stores a hashed password. So this is the C information. Uh, for some reason, my curse doesn't show. Okay, now I show it. So here is something related to my, to my, um, this is something that is related to my uh, password. It is a hash of, of my password. So you will not be able to know the exact password, uh, the exact password, but you will know that this is the hash to read out. And in fact, if you look at the permission of this file of uh, slash etc slash uh, shadow, and you will see that 
right? So you will see that a normal user will not be able to read. So that is the reason why if I just do normal cat, it will tell you that um, you cannot read it. You don't have the permission, right? So it says permission denied. So you have to make yourself to be a root like you to do. You have to sudo it or you have to belong to a group called shadow. So let me just sudo it and then cat this again. So this is me. So it says that this is my name and this is the password, the colon quote password, right? That is related to my, uh, this is the, uh, the hashed result for my password. And then the question is, how would you, how would, you know, the Linux system authenticate you then? So the way that it works is that given a password, then the Linux system will, like if someone's gonna type a password and maybe the true password or maybe the false password, then the Linux operating system will calculate the hash value of the typing input, the typed input. And then it will compare that hash to result where the hash to result stored in slash etc slash shadow and if it's the same then that's nice then you just pass and if it's not the same then it will reject you and then the way that linux hash or say crypt those passwords is to use different approach like previously originally it is a modified dds it's a das and now it's good that because we already talked about das in in crypto part so you know exactly what DAS is. And also um, besides DAS, recently Linux has, it has extended to the other different type of checksum such as MD5. So they call it crypt function, but it's not really encryption. I want to, um, to pay attention to this. Like crypt is just the name of the function that the uh, Linux operating system use to encrypt or to, you know, to convert a password to the hashed value. But it's not a crypto system because there's no way for you to really just like return, like revert it back or return, revert it back uh, easy. And there's no intention for this crypto system, like, sorry, not this crypto system, for this crypt function to encrypt back from C to A. And I, su I suppose this also answers Tate's function, like which encryption protocol does Linux use? So first of all, this is not really encryption protocol. This is not a crypto system, but I know what, you're, you, what you mean to ask. You wanna ask the specific function. So this function is called crypt and it is implemented as like a modified version of that or MD5 or other things. And Emma was asking, does the hash ID help verify identity? Yes. So uh, as I said, like the hash ID helps to uh, verify identity with a nice masking. So it stops uh, people to get the plain text, but it can still be used to verify identity. All right, and then Dean says that uh, the thought is to make rainbow tables significantly worse. And you're right. We will talk about rainbow tables later on in next lecture. And uh, the crypt function is how the machine co co converts the password to a hash. Right, you're right. Okay, and then for Unix encrypted password system, um, L is you know the uh, uh, sorry uh, L is the authentication function. Right, we just mentioned about that from the authentication system. So L is the the authentication system uh, function that verifies identity. And the way that L, like in Unix password system is a command such as login or SU. Like login is you log in for this specific identity. And SU is something that you want to uh, operate in order to privilege, like escalate your privilege from a normal user to root. 
And if I remember correctly, SU is short for uh, super user or something. Uh, correct me if I remember this wrong. You can also just like Google it. Like SU is short for something. I, I, be, I believe it is like something, I forgot the complete saying, but like it should be something that is, SU is something for short. Okay. And the next is about S, like something that you a, a user can operate in terms of those passwords. For example, you can you know, use password this specific command to change your password. Um, and now let me just show you very quickly in operating system, in a Linux system. All right, so here, if I'm gonna just type password, it's gonna say that I'm gonna change my password for myself. And it'll ask you for your current password. Let me just type something. Okay, so then it says that this is uh, authentication token manipulation error. So that is because I was typing a wrong password. So I didn't manage to pass the authentication. So I cannot change my password. Oh, thank you, Rahilo. So um, as you is substitute user. So it means that you want to substitute yourself with uh, root. Uh, where you can also just change it from not root. I mean, for SU, you can substitute yourself to other user as well. So SU is something that you can switch users. Right, thanks Aaron for correction. Um, so, um, I mean, for sudo, I think that is specific to actually, since I'm using my operating system, let me just check this really quickly. Yes, okay, for sudo and sudo, they're both like, try to execute a command as another user. So this is to execute the command directly. And then as you is, you just log into, uh, log, log in as another user. All right. Oh, um, Eric says that sudo is super user doing. Yes, you're correct. I messed up sudo and su. Thanks for those quick search and discussion about this name. I think, although it's not really technical, but it's really good to know about what are those name really mean. Cool. And then for more details about the Unix encrypted password system, I just found this link very useful. And if you're interested, you can just take a look. Okay, so that's about Unix encrypted password system. And then now let's have, let's talk about an example. So suppose that there are some external identity, right? And then there is a principal, um, which we call her Alice. So an S operation can be, I'm gonna create a password or I want to register Alice to the system. Um, and when I create a new user, I'm gonna give the service the identity, which is Alice in this case, and then the password, uh, you know, corresponding to this identity, Alice. And then for service provider, service provider will use the F uh, function, which is the complementation function that generate an encrypted password. And this is, why if you look at this, like if you check your slash gpc slash shadow, you will be able to see this specific file. Like this is the complementary information. And the password itself is A, right? And this is the C, the complementary information. All right. And then the system in the future will be able to authenticate to authenticate the um you know the uh, an object uh, uh, sorry a subject who's going to log into the system and the way that it works is that if someone is going to type a password then it's going to use the f function are you to... trying to show the slides right now because we can't see them oh i'm sorry yes i am i i want to show the slides i'm trying to show it just give me a second Thanks for reminding me, Stephen.
Okay. Now let me revert this back and let's talk about this again. So this is an example I want to show. We have some, you know, external entities, and one of them is Alice. It's the principal, Alice. And then we have a service provider. We can consider this as a, as a Linux or a Unix encrypted password system. So at the beginning, when Alice registers herself to the system, Alice is going to create a password with her identity. So her identity is Alice and she has a password. Let's just assume that the password is the password, like this string by itself. And then the service provider will use the F function. And if you remember, F is the complementation functions that will map from a password to a complementary information. So it will generate an encrypted password using it, using the password information. So it will generate this and it will store this information into the service. So here, A is the password, and then C is the hash of the password. And then later on, if Alice wanna log into the system, then the service provider, or say that the Unix system is gonna use its L function to decide whether or not this person was trying to log in as the true person. And the way that it works is that given a password, it will first call the F function, the complementation function again, to convert that from a typed password to another, like to a hashed information. And then it's gonna compare that hashed information to the true hashed information stored in the system. And if it's equal, then it's gonna return true. And otherwise it will just return false. And that's it about Unix encrypted password system. And if you look at the authentication system again, it has A, C, F, L, S, five elements. And if you look at here, we have A, C, F, L, S, all the, in, uh, all the necessary elements in the encrypted password system. All right, that's pretty much it for Unix encrypted system. And now let's move on to possible attack and a possible like defense. So first let's talk about possible attacking. So can you come up with some possible way if you're an attacker, how can you attack this encrypted system? Uh, or say, what's the goal if we're gonna attack this thing? What could you do? Okay, Emma says I'm looking for most common password. Rahila said brute force the password. Uh, and Austin says dictionary attack. So what you're all talking about is you're trying to, um, basically you're trying to get the password of a specific person, right? So you're assuming that you know identity. You know someone's identity, for example, Tiffany B. You know identity now, and now you try to get my password. So what you could do is you can just brute force my password or use like dictionary attack to, to get to guess my password is. You can also just try those common password like hello or like one, two, three, four, um, those common password to see if I'm using those, you know, like weak passwords. Okay, so as you said, one of the goal for attacker can be like, you want to find a specific password in the operating system, such that uh, for some of the um, you know f inform, uh, the the function that f a will be equal to the specific c. So that means that if you, for example, if you already know the c because everyone will have the access to read the file, then you want to guess a specific password. Um, that can be an attacker's goal. And a direct approach for attacker is that if attacker has a C, then the goal for you is to reverse, like find the A such that the F of A is equal to C. Or say, maybe attacker doesn't have a C, but attacker still wants to find a password so that it will be able to log into the system. Right, 
And now I'm going through the chat. I see Michael says that she, uh, he wants to create a password to get F. And right, that's right. This is something that we just mentioned. And Jordan said, try to intercept the hash password and use F to find a plain text. That's true. If you know like what the hash function is and then maybe you get the uh, pa hash password is and you're, you can try to reverse it, like try to find a plain text. You're like, maybe the hash function is not strong enough so that you can get the original plain text. And then Dean says that like app only goes from password to hash, not back. I mean, you're right. I mean, that is based on assumption that hash is strong. And in fact, like throughout this entire course, I would just say, if you're gonna have a hash function, if you're gonna have something related to hash function, your CPF or your assignment, I want you to assume that this hash function is very strong. Like um, for example, if I'm giving you an MD5, your goal is not to crack MD5. Or, or if I'm giving you a SHA, your goal is not to really crash SHA to like reverse back. But it, maybe I, I will give you a function, it's called hash, but it's super weak. You can tell that you can reverse it back. But if I'm gonna give you a common hash function, I'm not gonna assume that you will be able to revert it back. Okay, so those are some possible high-level attacking uh, approach so that you can crack the authentication system. And then the question is how you can prevent those attacks. So can you give some possible solutions? If you are a defender right now, and then you know that someone, for example, wants to get Tiffany's password, then what, you, what could you do to prevent those attacks? Uh, Emma says that long password, but now I want you to think about this from a systems perspective. Like I am the user. I may just really just give you a very weak password than what you could do. And I agree with them and Peter, that if you are a user, then you definitely want to have a stronger password. And Austin says one like system possible, like a system defense, limited number of attempted blockages. This is good. So that means that you just don't want to allow them to do brute force trial. Maybe someone they try for more than three times, you would just block their, them from trying, right? And two-factor authentication, right? That's also a good way to print, to defend. Uh, for example, someone may really just get the password of the other person, but you want to use two-factor to know that to confirm that someone who knows the password also has some other information such as like he has the correct cell phone or he has the uh, right key, right like temporary key that just to pass to the specific person. Okay, and there are also some other different kind of a thoughts. I'm just give you some example. For example, you wanna hide one of the uh, a or F or C, if you look at the system. So you want to hide the tag, uh, sorry, had the uh, a password. You want to had the um, the uh, the hash the value or you want to ha hide the way that the hash from a password to the hash value. And this will prevent some types of tag. And this is also something that you see that in the Linux system, right? So basically you, for Linux system, it hides A, it hides the plain text of the password. That's why if you look at slash etc password, you see X over there. And if you look at slash etc slash shadow, you see the C over there. And then for F it's public, so there's no way for it to hide, but for Linux system, it can hide A. Okay, and then another possibility, can we hide L? So L is the login, right? So remember that L is the way that user can use to log into the system. Can we hide L? So, or to be more specific, because L is a function, right? So L is the function that will output A uh, true or false. 
can we just prevent attacker from knowing if the guess is succeed? So that is a possible solution. Also, something that you could do is you can prevent uh, network-based logins, or you can just restrict login from a particular uh, IP addresses. So for example, VPN. VPN is a way that you re restrict L. So those users who only like who belongs to a certain IP address range will only be able to log in to do to the system. So you will not be able to uh, if you are in external users, you will not be able to log into this particular system. So this is um, about like hiding L or say like the first one is you just never tell attacker whether or not you log in successfully. Consider this, for example, a honeypot. Um, I don't know, by the way, I don't know if you guys have heard about honeypot before. Just let me know if you have heard about it or maybe not heard about this. So. Honeypot is something that is can it can trap like it's a trap basically, and then it can like attract attackers to log in, and then it may find that okay the attacker tries to log in with some specific password, and although attacker fails to log in, it will just pretend it will just show display face pretending that the attacker logs in successfully, so it is a nice example that. The system use deceptive means to prevent attacker to know like whether or not they log in successfully, like the true information. Okay, yep. So that's about different uh, possible ways to prevent attacks, and um, I will just like call it a day now. And I want to, you know, leave the rest for the next lecture, which will talk about different kinds of attacks, such as like dictionary attack, rainbow table attack, those things that you guys have mentioned. And that's pretty much for today. Thanks everyone. Next time we'll talk about all those attacks and just be prepared that we will have assignment released this week. Also, no class on Thursday. So you don't have to come on, on Thursday. I will see you in the next week. Thank you. Thank you. And in terms of assignment, uh, I am hoping that I can release the assignment on, on Wednesday. I'm not sure about it, but like that is my goal. Okay, sounds good. Uh, when's your office hours again? Is it uh, TAs, right? Today, I think my office hour is in, will be happening in 20 minutes. Oh, okay, awesome. Thank you. Sure. So if lecture is canceled on Thursday, does that mean that Wednesday night they're doing a live lecture or what are they showing on Wednesday night then? This so, lecture? Yes, this lecture will be showing on Wednesday. Okay. So tomorrow's gonna be a recorded session for this one. And then Thursday's gonna be no lecture. And then starting from next week, Monday will be, will be a live lecture. Okay, great, thank you. Sure.